Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Princeton University Press Ideas Podcast, a joint production of Princeton University Press and the New Books Network. I'm Mark Klobis, and today I'm speaking with Brianna Nofill, author of the book, The Migrant's Jail, An American History of Mass Incarceration. Brianna, welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, Mark. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you on our podcast. I was wondering if you could start us off by telling our listeners something about yourself. Yeah. um, So my name is Brianna Nofill. Um, I am a historian of immigration and the carceral state. Uh, I received my PhD in history from Columbia, and now I am very lucky to teach at the College of William and Mary, uh, which is in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, And I teach classes on migration, legal history, political history, uh, all sorts of good stuff. (laughs) So, I mean, it sounds like this book is very much within your wheelhouse, but what led you to write a general history about the incarceration of migrants in America? Yeah, it really grew out of uh, questions I had growing up and kind of throughout my life. Um, I grew up in South Florida, which is one of the central hubs of migrant incarceration um, in the U.S. And I grew up uh, not so far from a really important detention center called Chrome. It's Chrome with a K, which I always think makes it sound extra insidious. And Chrome (laughs) is located, it's down this like single road that snakes into the Florida Everglades and it's on what was once a missile testing facility like site like they tested missiles in the Everglades Um, but now um, and since the 1980s it is a migrant detention center and um, I always had questions about this right it feels just sort of strange um, that there is this that there is this strange space in the Everglades that no one really knows what happens there Um, I knew that it was incredibly hard for people to reach family members and friends who were in Chrome Um, and there was also sort of a community perception that Chrome was this really unequal space that far more Haitians um, when they came to South Florida were placed in Chrome uh, than any other migrant group And so this project really started as a history of South Florida, a history of um, this detention center that emerged in the 80s. But as it kind of evolved over the million years I've been working on it, um, I really started to wonder what preceded this. Like, I had the hunch that migrant detention occurred earlier and was happening earlier, um, but the scholarship didn't have a lot to say about it. And so that was really kind of where the project evolved into, was trying to figure out where were the origins of migrant incarceration and how did those um, earlier practices kind of lay the foundation for the chrome that started in the 80s and the chrome that I saw, um, you know, throughout my life. That level of engagement is a really interesting one, because one of the things I thought was very interesting about your book was how so much of this question is a is is, is is that of, the, of your work is centered in this question of space because i mean yeah as, as someone who is unfamiliar with the subject uh beyond you know just basically you know what i read in the news i think of it as, as basically this national issue this even this international issue and yet, as you described so much of the history of migrant detention is one of these local spaces and, and, and it's such a fascinating history because it's not just about simply this question of detaining migrants it gets into questions of of, of politics and 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 economics and 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 uh, american society as well Yeah, absolutely. So I think that is kind of the tension at the heart of the book is this notion, right, that immigration, border control, these are sovereign, exclusively federal powers. But throughout the nation's history of making restrictive immigration law, the federal government has never actually had the capacity, the manpower, the resources to carry out these restrictive immigration laws. Um, And in order to actually do so or to make some attempt at doing so, they have depended so heavily on the cooperation of localities. Um, And that was one of the real revelations for me in thinking beyond Chrome. Chrome is a federal site, um, but far more detention centers throughout history and even today have not been operated by the federal government. They've just been your local city and county jail. Um, So a big part of what this book is doing is that it's showing that migrant detention was possible um, since the end of the 19th century 
because city councils and sheriffs were getting paid by the federal government for each migrant they detained in their local jails. So migrant detention isn't just a story of spaces that are called immigration detention centers, right? It is a story about how migrants are stashed and moved and trafficked um, throughout all of these sort of existing carceral spaces in the United States and the real lack of visibility uh, that creates for the practice. I think one of my favorite parts about your book is the counterintuitive start that you make with it. I mean that by we t so often tend to think of uh, the question of micro detention as being one that is a an exclusively a southern border state issue, and uh, you know California, Arizona, Texas, Florida all make very prominent appearances in it. But you start the book on the other side of the country. You start it in Northern New York and you open it with this very interesting description of how this developed with the detention of Chinese migrants to America who are coming to the United States through Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in the early years of the 20th century, migration through Canada is a really popular route for Chinese migrants who are trying to uh, evade the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred all laborers, all Chinese laborers from entering the United States. Um, and Canada is a good route, or it looks like a good route for a lot of folks because their laws are uh, more lax than the United States. Um, but it's a big journey, as you can imagine, right? Like most migrants who come this way they're going to take a ship from China to the west coast of Canada. Then they're going to have to take a train across all of Canada. Um, and then we see what I thought was absolutely surprising when I was doing this research. Uh, this really, really significant route of migration happened through northern New York. And this route creates an immediate puzzle for what is a really young Bureau of Immigration, right? It's barely even an agency at this point. It's really early in its history. Um, and they say, you know, for migrants who are entering at San Francisco, we have Angel Island. For migrants who are entering at in New York City, we have we have Ellis Island, but where are we supposed to put people who are entering into these incredibly rural, um, fairly isolated communities in Northern New York? And so I think this is one of the spaces where the Immigration Service really starts to pioneer this arrangement with working with localities. And so one of the things that we see is that they start making these cash offers to sheriffs. Um, the sheriffs in most communities operate the local jail. So they say, you know, we're the federal government. We don't have the right to this local space that local taxpayers are paying for. But we will give you X amount of dollars for each night you hold a migrant for the Immigration Service. And in these rural communities, it becomes really, it, it produces significant revenue, right? So one of the things that, that really shocked me um, is that we start to see these communities not only sort of, you know, saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to this, but they're act actively campaigning for the federal government to send them more migrants. So it's really contrary, I think, to a lot of sort of notions we have of what um, Chinese migration looked like in rural places, um, because we really see this notion that the Chinese prisoner uh, can be a commodity for rural communities. And yet, as you explain, just because these rural leaders desired these Chinese migrants as commodities doesn't mean that they were necessarily treated uh, humanely or decently. And I'm thinking about uh, that because it it's interesting because these migrants are, 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 are existing in this very unusual space that is designed for criminals, that is designed for people who or for people who are accused of crimes, but are oftentimes repeat offenders and and therefore are are are, are people with histories of violence, and yet they're being put. Uh, and yet you're seeing you know, in these spaces these migrants who have, you know, committed no violent crimes who are are seeking or merely seeking opportunity. They're now being thrust into the same spaces, and how this oftentimes creates tension and all sorts of problems. That. As you, you know, elaborate upon, the, the local officials are not often great at addressing. Yeah, absolutely. No, the conditions are, um, they're horrific in these jails. Um, the, the jails in most communities, you know, 
jails can look really different. They, they continue to look really different uh, depending on the city and county they're in. Um, but especially in rural communities, right? The local jail is often basically just like a barn with some bars on the windows, right? These are not spaces that anyone ever anticipated hundreds of people unexpectedly ending up in. Um, so the conditions are really awful. And I think um, one of the other things that I found fascinating is how much putting migrants in jails, right? And people have a notion of who belongs in a jail. It creates a lot of tension, even, even in you know the year 1900, about if migrants, if people who entered the United States in a way that the United States didn't authorize, is that a criminal act? Right. And I think it's really interesting as we think about sort of how migrant illegality is constructed. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how, how it's constructed through law, but I think it's really interesting to also think about sort of how it is constructed in these communities just by the fact that migrants are in this shared space, right? That people associate um, with law breaking, with criminality. Um, but people have big questions, right? Throughout every single episode I look at in this book, there are always community members who are asking questions, who are saying, is this actually ethically defensible? Is it in line with our religious values? Is it in line with American notions of due process? So for as long as there has been migrant detention, there has also been, I think, a deep discomfort in, in often unexpected circles um, about this practice that seems so ill at ease um, with so many values America purports to hold. And yet so many patterns are established during this period that largely remain true today. And one of the uh, one of the aspects of that is how a lot of this gets arbitrated uh, judicially through the courts and how ultimately the Supreme Court, which notoriously during this period has no real concern for 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 Chinese migrants, uh, hands down a lot of decisions that still define the uh, migrant carceral state to this day. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Chinese exclusion era is, is really where we get the notion that underlies all of migrant incarceration, which is that this is the Supreme Court gives us this just devastatingly vague phrase where they say this is not imprisonment in a legal sense. Right. And then they also give us the second really important precedent which is that deportation is not a punishment for a crime. Um, and those are the kind of things that can sound, you know, maybe good the first time you hear them, but then you think about it and you, you realize, right, if, if it's not punishment for a crime, then, you know, potentially all of these questions about due process, about uh, right to an attorney, right to jury by your peers, they're all up in the air. And so uh, this is a, it's a big tension. It's a big tension of how, like, how can you have administrative incarceration? How can incarceration not be a punishment? And that is a very tricky legal and political line that I think people are walking uh, throughout throughout this whole history. So with templates and patterns being established during this early period, during the uh, the very tail end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, how does migrant uh, incarceration evolve during uh, the, the the first uh, four decades of the 20th century? Yeah, it evolves in really big ways. One of the things that I think is um, interesting looking at Northern New York in particular is that Northern New York gives us an interesting snapshot of how these new federal laws are changing who is entering through this region, right? So at first, it's almost entirely Chinese immigrants. But by the 1920s and the 1930s, we get things like the quota law, which is going to be the first major restriction of migration from Europe. And so what that means is that now Europeans who could have entered the United States with relative ease a few decades earlier, they're also potentially looking for unauthorized routes into the United States. Um, and many of them are going to look to the same route that Chinese migrants pioneered a few decades prior. So many of these same communities that once were so enthusiastic about jailing Chinese migrants and the money it was bringing them, we start to see that they have a lot more concerns uh, when the federal government starts asking them to jail large numbers of European migrants, and in particular, when they start being asked to jail white women and children. Um, and these, these cases, these cases in particular of, of women in county jails, migrant women, um, they are going to start to generate a lot of negative publicity. They're going to get media coverage, and more and more communities are going to start to wonder if it is 
worth the trouble. Um, and that creates a big problem for the immigration service because they are so reliant on these sheriffs and on these communities playing ball that when they start to kind of bulk at the idea of migrant incarceration, uh, it forces the federal government to start thinking of alternatives. And one of the alternatives is what if we started building federal detention sites? What if we started building some sort of migrant detention site um, of our own? It's interesting because they have a model to look at because as you describe in the book, that was how some of the localities in Northern New York ultimately coped with this influx of uh, detention uh, of detainees that they were actively seeking was when the, when the jails got too filled, they created specialized detention centers just for that population. To what degree did that serve as, as, as sort of a, a model that the federal government was, was adopting versus say, uh, you know, drawing upon other, you know, uh, concepts for the uh, for what they were now exploring. Yeah, so in the early years of the 20th century, many of these communities start building what they call Chinese jails, um, which are segregated um, separate sites of migrant detention. Um, my impression is that that is seen more as like a short term coping mechanism for just the volume of people they're being asked to detain. I think when the federal government starts exploring um, building its own facilities, what they're really basing a lot of that off of is their model of federal prisons. Um, so the, the government has federal prisons at this point. They are absolutely rife with problems, um, but there is a precedent, right, that the federal government, that, that incarceration might not just be state and local, but that the federal government can also kind of have car a carceral apparatus of its own. Um, and we see this kind of throughout the second half of the 20th century when they are looking for insights into what these facilities might look like. They're working really closely with the Bureau of Prisons. The Bureau of Prisons is sort of the model for building these sites. Um, but it absolutely is really expanding the federal government's role in incarceration when they start to think um, about these migrant detention facilities. And that role, of course, expands even more dramatically when you get to the Second World War and the detention of hundreds of thousands of, of Japanese Americans. And, and I have to confess, I mean, it was it was a subject that I, I have a bit of familiarity with, but I never really considered it in the con in the context of of, of migrant incarceration. How exactly does uh, the Second World War affect migrant detention, and and how does the question change because of the war? Yeah, it's a great, it, it is something that I struggled with in, in writing this, sort of how the story of Japanese and Japanese American incarceration fits in this story, because in some ways, it doesn't feel like it is migrant incarceration, right? Like many, the, the majority of the people who are being uh, detained during World War II are Japanese Americans. They're not they're not migrants, they're citizens. Um, but I was surprised as I started um, looking into this more, sort of just how big of a role the immigration service uh, had in the, in the running of these camps, particularly in the early days, um, and how much the immigration services prior experience in jailing people and apprehending people people was considered incredibly relevant um, when World War II broke out. Um, so many of the agencies that are being created are new wartime agencies, but the Immigration Service is one of the only sort of federal agencies involved that has decades of experience um, in working with jails and figuring out incarceration logistics and figuring out apprehension of logistics. And that is all deemed really, really relevant. Um, when Japanese incarceration begins. Um, I think one of the big legacies of the war for migrant incarceration is that it brings a lot of these concerns about the ethics and morality of detention uh, to a head because it arms people who are uncomfortable or you know, deeply opposed to detention with this new rhetoric of concentration camps that they can wield against this practice. So we really start to see more organization um, among groups who are opposed to detention, uh, and we also see for the first time in the early 1950s, the federal government denounces migrant detention. They say, we are only going to use it in exceptional circumstances. And a lot of that has to do with the pressure they are getting um, from activist groups, but also just from, you know, sort of not particularly radical Congress people who are uncomfortable, who are uncomfortable with it as well. 
So the government denounces migrant incarceration, um, but there are some pretty some pretty big caveats to that to that denouncing, and um, that is really where we start to see this massive upsurge of detention on the on the U.S. Mexico border. It gets to the aspect of your book that that and, and this is not a, a, a criticism of your book by any stretch, but but the depressing repetitiveness of this that it, it seems as though there, there's there's an awareness that that migrant detention is a very very flawed approach to this and yet it's it's the one that we keep defaulting to in part because of the precedents that the legal and 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 uh, bureaucratic precedents that were established and and, and the fact that it, you know, the, the notion of accepting these numbers is now so politically contentious it seems it's presented as a binary choice we can either detain them or we can let them go which one do you want the american voter and it's and so many politicians as you described especially as we're now starting to talk about people coming in from the south increasing numbers of of hispanics uh also you you'll, you'll talk uh when you get to the 1970s about the haitians as well and how that and that that, that there's that element that's that's always in the background that that people won't you know come out and and, and note openly but it is is as you've already alluded to is very much a factor in this yeah, absolutely. I it is so maddeningly repetitive. <laughs> I very much know that also. Um, I think one of the things that feels so cyclical to me is uh, this pattern that you see over and over again, which is that you know the government will say, "Okay, the jails are really bad. We all agree that it's not ideal to be holding people in jails. Ergo, we'll start making our own federal detention sites, and those won't have the same problems. Those will be special." But then massive problems occur at the federal detention sites, right? And so then they say, yeah, there's some problems here. So we'll take migrants out of the federal detention sites and we will diffuse them through our network of jails. And that just keeps going, right? So it's sort of wherever the crisis is, wherever the bad publicity is, the sort of solution is never to seriously interrogate why we are incarcerating these people or to contemplate decarceration, it is always just kind of to switch between a federal and local approach. And it really, in a lot of senses, just kind of hides the people, right? So that is the thing that to me, I just over and over again, right? That is the solution that seems to be um, arrived at. And, and that shell game that you're describing is one that is that the localities are eager to participate in because one of the, the one of the other constants is that they still find this to be enormously profitable it, it speaks to in a sense how under-resourced these communities are to where they welcome the idea of accepting this group albeit on a temporary basis in, in because they're, they're making so much money off it I, I was thinking about one of the uh uh, descriptions you have in later chapters about how they were making something like a uh, it was a, like a 400 percent boost to the county budget as uh, one area that was uh detaining uh it was i i, I think it was haitian migrants in the 70s mm -hmm. and and how i can understand from a uh from a governing perspective you can't say no to that as as if whatever your your moral qualms are or or, or maybe your, your practical considerations is that you know what you know, for the federal government is is a relatively small amount of money for these co these communities is huge. Absolutely, yeah. It's it is it is pretty stunning. I think how much revenue many of these communities are making from migrant incarceration. It's definitely not every community. You know, there's plenty of communities that are just housing a few people. It is not a significant source of income. But for the communities that really work closely with the immigration service it becomes a major pillar of many of their budgets. And so not only is that sort of, you know, questionable, but it also means that when this group of people goes away, right, if they are, you know, removed from this jail, it kind of creates a, a problem for these places. They have to figure out how to make up that revenue. Um, the other problem that I think we see over and over again is that many of these communities are going to actually expand their jails. Um, and they're gonna do that because they say, we're getting so many people from the immigration service and we want the immigration service to keep working with us. We wanna show we're a good, serious partner. So we'll expand our jail, right? And so if the immigration service stops working with them, if whatever migrant community that's moving through this area stops 
stops, they now are left with giant jails. Um, and they're often left with giant bonds they took out to pay for these jails, right? And so they're going to probably end up locking up someone. If it's not migrants, it's probably going to be, you know, citizens, people in the community. So I think that's significant, right? Because I think it, it shows us how, like, migrant incarceration and mass incarceration are deeply intertwined projects across the 20th century. It's not just kind of like migrant incarceration emerges out of mass incarceration in the late 20th century, but this notion that we are um, detaining migrants is going to lead communities to really think about their jails differently. Um, the jail isn't just sort of um, a thing that costs communities money to run, um, just sort of a, you know, quite a big line item on most counties' budgets, but what if the jail could actually be something that produced money for the county? Um, so that is, I think, I think that's a huge and important shift uh, in how localities think about incarceration, and it has just, you know, devastating, dangerous precedents in a, in a multitude of ways. And then, of course, you take that to its logical conclusion when you decide to start setting up companies which exist, you know, to make a profit out of incarcerating people. And yet, the, one of the ways they, the, the, one of the ways that they, you know, the approaches they need to adopt in order to do this is to, you know, minimize their costs. Do the conditions for migrants during this period uh, improve in these systems? Do they keep getting worse, or is it, or, or, or are they always kind of maintain this? depressingly low level despite uh you know whatever criticisms they receive yeah so i think that by the time we get to the the latter half of the 20th century um there is some effort from the immigration service to start creating standards rules <laughs> the radical idea of maybe some standards and rules um, for migrant detention sites uh, and part of the reason for that is because there is so much prisoner rights litigation happening in the 70s that the immigration service says oh we cannot be far behind right if, if all of these um, incarcerated people are successfully bringing legal cases against institutions it is only a matter of time before immigration service sites start seeing some of that same litigation. Um, but I think one of the things that's significant, right, is that even when the immigration service starts putting these rules and standards into place, they typically do not apply to contractors. They only apply to these federal immigration detention sites, which are, again, a minority of all the sites the immigration service is using. So one of the cases I talk about in my book um, is in the 90s, there's a big scandal at Chrome uh, where Congress is coming to visit and just, uh, you know, all sorts of the darkest shenanigans you've ever heard of in your life happen. Like they hide migrants in closets. They make everyone remove their guns. They're basically like, we're going to put on a good show because Congress is coming. Um, so Congress catches on to this. It's a big scandal. It's called Chrome Gate in South Florida. Um, and the solution after this happens is to take migrants out of Chrome and then put them in South Florida or North Florida, all Florida jails. So one of the things that happens is that now migrants that are, have been removed from Chrome where things were bad are now in these county jails where there are absolutely no standards. Um, and so there is this case in Mariana, Florida, where uh, a group of Afro-Cuban migrants are essentially electrocuted with these electrified shields. Uh, that local law enforcement in this community has access to. Uh, they even threaten uh, pregnant women with these shields. Um, these are migrants who are protesting in the jail. And so it leads a lot of people to say, well, you know, what happened here? Um, and the, I, the Immigration Service says, well, these shields are banned in Immigration Service facilities, but they weren't in Immigration Service facilities, right? They were detained in local jails. So they were being held by the rules with the technologies, with the power of local officials. So I think it's sort of a reminder um, of all of the, you know, it, it, is, it is progress in some ways that, that rules are being standardized, but there are so many people in the system who those rules will have little to no effect on. Now, so many of these works of history can be about periods and we have to consider their lessons for today, but you take your study to the present day. And you talk about how since we've had this the, this uh, movement for prisoners' rights, since we've had uh, immigrant communities who have become more active in uh, in, 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 in uh, 
in terms of protesting conditions and in terms of litigating conditions, this has you know led to various changes. And you have uh, a chapter where you talk about the modern mo uh, models of migrant incarceration. And, and you talk about, uh, I, I apologize if I mispronounce this, Ayel's Parish. And, yeah. and I, I, was, I was ready to talk about how, what that says about what's changed and also about what hasn't. Yeah, so Avoyle Parish is a really interesting example. It's located in central Louisiana. Um, and I think it is one of the communities that really exemplifies uh, what migrant incarceration could look like in, in the late 20th century and today. Uh, so uh, with, this, with this parish, sort of, they have a sheriff who is, I think, particularly enterprising. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> Louisiana. It's, it's, it's probably one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try not to get sued. Um, the, the, the Louisiana is in an absolute like financial uh, crisis, right? Unemployment is incredibly high in his community. Um, and there is this series of, of issues uh, at a federal detention site um, involving uh, a group of people who came over in the early 1980s uh, in the Mario boat lift. Um, so this is a group of Cuban refugees who arrived in 1980 um, and who uh, th this group of people who were held in federal prisons was mostly people who were after after they were released um, from immigration custody they committed or they were you know convicted of committing some kind of criminal act so for most of them that would have been a minor drug offense but certainly it ran the gamut so now the U.S. is left with this group of people who um, once had refugee status, who they would now like to deport, uh, but Fidel Castro will not take them back. So it is an absolute, like, uh, it, it is a predicament, right? Um, because it raises this question of whether a group of people who cannot be deported um, can in fact be detained in American institutions forever. Um, so uh, the Immigration Service goes to this Louisiana sheriff and they say, will you hold some of these people? And he says, oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And not only does he hold them, he expands basically all of the jails in his parish. He manages to like, um, you know, he's got like 20 people working for him at the start of this. He's got like 400 people working for the sheriff's office at the end. He basically turns incarceration into the local business. Right. Um, and we hear all of these sheriffs in this era say this is an incredible this is incredible for us. Right. Because part of the problem with migrant detainees was that eventually, you know, many of them left. But this is a group of people who potentially are here forever. So this could be like the most stable investment our community ever makes. Um, so I think one of the things that shows us right is that different groups of people like create different potentials for revenue. Um, the, the sort of the revenue motive, I think is pretty consistent throughout the, throughout the 20th century. Um, but one of the new things that we start to see is that private prison companies um, in the 80s and 90s are really, really interested in this too, right? These enterprising sheriffs are not the only ones who see that there is money to be made here. So it really does introduce sort of a new element when now sheriffs are either potentially working with private prison companies or they're working against private prison companies. Um, and everyone is kind of trying to figure out how they can, how they can best monetize uh, migrant incarceration. So in your final chapter, you do talk about migrant detention today. And I was wondering if you could perhaps uh, f finish up for us here by talking a bit about what is different about migrant detention today from, say, uh, previous eras, and, and what are the, the, the commonalities that, that never do seem to change for, for better or for worse? Yeah, so I think the biggest difference today is just scale. Um, the scale is absolutely staggering today. Um, it has, the number of migrants incarcerated has decreased pretty significantly uh, from 2019. And a lot of that has to do with, um, almost all of it has to do with COVID. Um, However, the numbers are the numbers are steadily creeping back up. 
So I think that is definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, but even compared to the 80s, right, the number of people being incarcerated for immigration offenses today is just absolutely massive. So one of the things that means, right, is that the immigration service is simply working with far more communities than they ever have before. They are, they are managing a roster of collaborators, um, both localities, but also these private prison companies um, on a scale that is sort of, you know, it, it, it is unprecedented um, in, the, in the rest of the, the story that I tell. Um, I think that one of the things that is sort of important to me to stress about looking at migrant incarceration today, um, I think just in incarceration generally, right, we tend to hear a lot about private prison companies, um, and private co prison companies have a massive role in immigration detention. Um, one of the critiques, um, of like Obama and Biden when they when they said that there weren't going to be federal uh, prisons given to private prison companies anymore was that it didn't include immigration detention and immigration detention is where most of these uh, companies make most of their money today. Um, however, so I think that there might be a notion that private prison companies replace localities, right? That like it, it's easier to contract this out to a company than it is to a local government. Um, but that is really not the case. Localities role in this system has never been bigger. And one of the reasons for that is because many of these private prison contracts that community uh, that the federal government is signing for immigration detention, uh, they're not signing them directly with the private companies. They are signing them with local governments and then local governments are contracting out to private prison companies. So it's the kind of thing that maybe doesn't sound that like that big of a deal, but it's a huge deal um, because it means that, you know, if you're a federal government and you want to contract, there's all these rules, there's all these regulations, you have to take bids. But if you're contracting with a locality, it is much simpler. There's much less paperwork. Um, there's much less oversight in a lot of ways. So local governments in many cases are acting as a middleman between the federal government and the private prison companies. So localities continue to be absolutely critical. Um, I think this is going to be an important thing to keep an eye on in the coming years, because I think that sort of so many of the fights that are currently going on and that will continue to happen in, in the years to come are really these questions of federalism, right? They're questions about what role states and localities can play in immigration law enforcement. Can G G Governor Abbott of Texas put barbed wire across the Rio Grande? Can uh, Florida's Governor DeSantis, can he bus migrants to other states? Um, what can local law enforcement do? Can you declare your city a sanctuary city without federal penalties. And these are all fundamentally questions about how the federal government and the local governments work together to police immigration. And they are questions and tensions um, that have been playing out over, over a really long period of time. We appreciate the time you've taken to speak with us. But before we go, could you tell us what you're working on now? Uh, yeah, so I am mostly uh, just thinking about this book. I would love to come talk to your students about this book. Um, <laughs> but I am, uh, this book has really, really made me interested in the history of sheriffs. I think that is one of the, one of the big takeaways. I don't feel like I fully understood exactly how much um, power sheriffs have over their local budgets. I think they are maybe like this unheralded force in mass incarceration. So I, I am definitely uh, sort of continuing to think about the role of sheriffs and immigration law going forward. Well, it sounds like a, a fascinating subject. I, I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you so much. Brianna, thank you for, for taking some time out of your schedule to speak with us. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. It's been great.